Well, Jason, I want to clarify that rather thin document that Jason was holding up. That's only the abridged version. Uh, I mean, the, the, the full verse is much, much of Scotland's future, much, much bigger than that. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm sure there are, uh, are copies uh, around. But th this, is the, uh, this is the second time in the last eight do days that I've been uh, next uh, door to the United Kingdom Cabinet. Uh, last week, they, they paid a, a flying visit to Aberdeen, while the, the Scottish Cabinet was in Port Lethen, just uh, five miles away. Uh, and this week, I'm here at the, the heart of Westminster. And I mention this because if David Cameron does walk in any time during this, uh, this session, then I've got uh, the exclusive uh, permission from Jason to change this into a debate format. Uh, the, what I also say that I, I was uh, interested, there was a story in Independent today uh, under the headline, is this the, the scariest uh, photograph ever? And it's a picture of David Cameron and myself at King's Cross Station, which was certainly scary to me, incidentally, but nonetheless, there we were at King's Cross Station uh, uh, advertising a, a network rail rover card. Uh, but these were actually lookalikes, uh, as opposed to... And my complaint about this, uh, and I think what the Independent were alluding to in terms of the scariness of the picture, is that his lookalike looked more lookalike than my lookalike. My lookalike hasn't caught up with my 5 plus 2 diet, uh, and I, I, I demand accurate doppelgangers. I, I, I think it's only reasonable I get the respect of uh, uh, having a doppelganger who goes on the, the, the same diet as, uh, as me. But it's worth, worth a look, but uh, you know, just for the record, we weren't a, at, uh, in a railway carriage yesterday. Uh, and we didn't have the debate that the country should see. But uh, the serious point is that debate will have to take place. Uh, and it will have to take place sooner rather than later. Now, it is a pleasure to be back in uh, Westminster and to deliver this, uh, this new statesman lecture. Uh, I've, all, and I, I've been asked by Jason to emphasise this point, just as I asked him to emphasise the white paper. I hope you have all bought a, a copy of your Scotland special edition. And I hope that it's given you some sense of the vitality of the debate that's currently taking place in Scotland. Now, I want to start tonight's speech by emphasising a, a point which occasionally the media and certainly UK politicians sometimes lose sight of. Uh, if we vote yes in September, uh, then Scotland will become independent uh, in more promising circumstances than virtually any nation in history. In fact, nobody really doubts that an independent Scotland could be successful. Uh, I shall quote uh, the other doppelganger. Even David Cameron once put it like this. Supporters of independence will always be able to cite examples of small, independent, thriving economies such as Finland, Switzerland and Norway. It would be wrong to suggest that Scotland could not be another such successful independent country. Uh, he should have a word with his Chancellor occasionally, shouldn't he? But David Cameron omitted to mention that Finland's GDP per head is 10% higher than the UK, Switzerland is 50% higher, uh, and Norway is 85% higher per head. But nonetheless, the point is well made. Now, that consensus, the consensus about whether Scotland could be a successful independent country, it reflects the underlying economic strength for Scotland. We would become an independent country as one of the wealthiest nations in the OECD. Scotland has contributed more in taxes per person than the rest of the UK for every single one of the last 30 years. Uh, last Thursday, Standard & Poor's, the rating agency, which for the duration of this speech I'm rechristening Standard & Rich, uh, joined the consensus. It noted, quote, in brief, we would expect Scotland to benefit from all of the attributes of an investment-grade sovereign credit characterised by its wealthy economy, roughly the size of New Zealand, high-quality human capital, flexible product and labour markets, and transparent institutions. That's of standard and poor. However, the current balance sheet is only part of the economic story. We should also look at the potential of a country. Scotland has more universities in the world top 200 per head of population than any country in the planet. We have huge expertise in engineering and life sciences, an astounding cultural heritage, immense energy and natural resources, and above all, a skilled and inventive people. So there is no doubt, none whatsoever, that Scotland could be an independent country. 
The question the people of Scotland will answer on the 18th of September is about whether we should be an independent country. And I want to put that forward tonight uh, as essentially a choice between two futures. That's the real choice that I want to talk about this evening. In one way, Scotland with one choice will be part of what is an increasingly imbalanced United Kingdom with high social inequalities, growing regional disparities and more often than not governments we didn't vote for. With the other, the other choice, we'll have the powers that we need to create a better country to build the Scotland we want to see, the Scotland we seek. Now, I want to start with a letter sent recently by 27 Church of England bishops blaming the rise in food banks on, quote, cutbacks to and the failures in the benefit system. Now, the letter struck me for, for two reasons. The first is that when I was uh, helping the Edinburgh South Food Bank just before Christmas, the Trussell Trust told me that in 2011, they have one food bank in the whole of Scotland. Uh, now they run 43. 50,000 people in Scotland have used them in the last nine months. And the second reason that the letter struck me was the, the strength, the unusual strength of the, the language used by the good bishops. It's been reflected actually in some of the comments recently made by the Archbishop of Westminster, now the Cardinal Vincent Nichols. And it struck me because it reminded me that it's 25 years ago, almost exactly to the day, that leaders of Scotland's three largest churches joined together to condemn a UK government policy as, quote, undemocratic, unjust, socially divisive and destructive of community and family life. That letter, the letter from the uh, Scottish churches, was written on the eve of the introduction of the poll tax in Scotland, and it expressed perfectly the widespread anger about the tax which commanded support from only 10 of then 72 Scottish members of Parliament. Uh, and as this audience will know, the poll tax became a totemic issue in Scotland, the supreme example of a, a policy imposed upon us in the teeth of massive public opposition. Uh, and one reason why the Scottish people endorsed devolution so overwhelmingly in 1997 was to stop anything sim similar ever happening again. So it's worth repeating that phrase used by the church leaders 25 years ago. Undemocratic, unjust, socially divisive, destructive of community and family life. Last April, the, the bedroom tax came into force. It is affecting more than 70,000 households across Scotland, 80% of whom have a disabled person. It was opposed by more than 90% of Scotland's MPs. And as we know, it's part of a package of welfare changes, again opposed by more than 90% of Scotland's MPs, which have seen the growth of food banks in which children's charities now forecast will see tens of thousands more children born into poverty by 2020. However, these policies, it should be understood, are exacerbating social trends which have actually prevailed over some considerable period of time. <coughs> the OECD, the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development, reported three years ago that since 1975, inequality among working age people has increased faster in the United Kingdom than in any other member country. Even before the current government came into office, Professor Danny Dorling calculated the UK was the fourth most unequal country in the developed world, and it hardly seems likely that the position has improved since then. And regional inequalities have grown alongside social inequalities. The UK now has the highest levels of regional inequality of any country in the European Union. The UK's business secretary recently called London, quote, a kind of giant suction machine draining the life out of the rest of the country, unquote. Now, I'm uh, a lot more moderate in my views than Vince Cable. I'll just repeat that. I'm claiming to be more moderate than a Liberal Democrat, OK? London, in my estimation, is one of the world's great cities, uh, and much of that success should be celebrated. And it uh, should be said also the, the gravitational pool of London isn't new, this building itself was constructed at the end of the 19th century because the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, which had been based in Birmingham since 1847, decided it should move to a London headquarters. But London's influence is infinitely stronger now. And it's impossible to deny that the attraction of capital and talent to London is one of the defining features of the UK economy. A recent report by the Centre of Cities noted that 80% of private sector job creation was taking place in London. 
And Professor Tony Travers of the LSE said, London is the dark star of the economy, inexorably sucking in resources, people and energy. Nobody knows quite how to control it. And again, David Cameron argued before he became Prime Minister that an economy with such a narrow foundation for growth is fundamentally wasteful and unstable. But the record is a lot weaker than the Prime Minister's words. A couple of years ago, the Institute for Public Policy in the Regions published a report called On the Wrong Track. It found that public spending on major transport infrastructure amounted to £2,600 per head in London and £5 per head in the northeast of England. That's £5 per head in the northeast of England. Now, I'm the First Minister of Scotland, meaning all of Scotland. Uh, and if the government which I lead were responsible for such massive disparities, eh, we wouldn't chan stand a chance of re-election. There's a growing realisation that wealth and opportunities are too concentrated geographically as well as socially. And UK government policies are working for too few, denying opportunities for too many. Britain is imbalanced. But when I, uh, when I sat across the road first in the, the Westminster Chamber, uh, the redoubtable Eric Heffer, the MP for Liverpool Walton, used to sit right behind me uh, on the Labour backbenches. Uh, and Eric hadn't always favoured uh, devolution, but the experience of uh, Margaret Thatcher's government changed his mind. Uh, and whenever I was making speeches about Scottish independence, I used to hear Eric growling behind me, remember Alec, Liverpool's coming way. <laughs> now, I I'm not suggesting tonight that we take up Eric Heffer's offer. But it is interesting. In the last year, we've seen a real determination from councils and cities in the north of England to see a prosperous and empowered Scotland as an opportunity as opposed to a threat. The Association of North East Councils in Cumbria commissioned academic research which found, and I quote, the prospect of further autonomy for Scotland is also stimulating new interest in the North East Cumbria and Scotland to work more collaboratively together. We're now seeing a, a practical expression of that as the local authorities in both countries working together begin to explore how best to jointly promote business, tourism and, above all, transport links. The Borderlands Initiative, as it is known, highlights that its practical cross-border cooperation, which would continue and indeed could be strengthened by Scottish independence, uh, when the nations of these islands share a, a partnership of equals based on our many areas of common interest. And after Scottish independence, the growth of a, a strong economic power in the north of these islands would benefit everyone, our closest neighbours in the north of England more than anyone. There would be a, a northern light to address the influence of the dark star, rebalancing the economic centre of gravity across these islands. Now, there are those who worry that Scottish independence would leave an England entrenched in conservatism, as Helena Kennedy put it in the, the New Statesman uh, edition. However, it's worth noting that since 1945, there actually have only been two elections, in 1964 and the, and the first election of 1974, where the largest party at Westminster would have been different if Scotland had been independent. Uh, these two governments sat for a total of 26 months. Independence would have very little impact on the political arithmetic at Westminster. Although it would finally provide the definitive answer to the West Lothian question, Scottish MPs would no longer vote on policies primarily or entirely concerning England. Indeed, Scotland, I would argue, will be a more influential and valuable as an independent nation than we can be by contributing 9% of Westminster MPs. We wouldn't, of course, always get things right. Sometimes the rest of the UK might learn from our mistakes. But we would exert a powerful positive influence through example, the beacon of progressive opinion. And independence would address a profound democratic deficit in Scotland. Not a, a passing inconvenience, but a debilitating disconnect at the very heart of politics. I'm uh, 59 years old. Now, I can see you all thinking you don't look at... Uh, I know you're all thinking that. For more than uh, half of my life, Scotland has been ruled with parties with no majority. In the last four UK elections, the Conservatives in Scotland have scored 
Nilpuan won one and one seat, respectively, over the four elections. Now, this is not an abstract point, a constitutional theory. It affects the well-being and prosperity of individuals and communities across the country. The Conservative Party have lost every general election in Scotland since 1959, but have succeeded in ending up in government for 31 of the last 55 years. Now, I spoke earlier about the bedroom tax. It's a good example, not simply because it's unjust, although it is, but because it's a policy that would never have been passed by a parliament with Scotland's interests at heart. It's driven primarily by rising rental and housing benefit costs here in London and the southeast of England. And although 60,000 people in Scotland will be penalised unless they move into single bedroomed accommodation, we currently have a supply of just 20,000 single bedroomed homes for social rent. In many parts of the UK, the bedroom tax is unpopular. In an independent Scotland, it would have been unthinkable. Because of devolution, because of having the Parliament, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP Government have been able to work together in the Scottish Parliament to mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax. As a result, nobody will face eviction in Scotland this year solely as a result of that tax. But we haven't abolished the bedroom tax because the Scottish Parliament doesn't have the power to abolish the bedroom tax. Instead, we've developed a, an expensive framework of measures to try and cancel out the consequence of a policy that nobody in Scotland would ever have come up with in the first place. Wouldn't it have been better for us just to have responsibility for the welfare system instead of having to compensate for a policy we didn't vote for? Uh, and the bedroom tax is not an isolated example. Scottish MPs have voted against the Welfare Benefits Up Rating Bill, Child Benefit Means Testing, Cuts in Capital Spending, Royal Mail Privatisation, and many, many more of the current coalition policies. But despite all of that, all of these policies have been or will be implemented in Scotland. When the Scottish people voted overwhelmingly for devolution in 1997, many of them thought it would address the democratic deficit in Scotland. However, devolution has dramatised, not ended, the democratic deficit. Now, that's partly because of the contrast people now see between the record of the Scottish Parliament and the record of the Westminster Parliament. Uh, there's a contrast of approach. In the northeast of uh, Scotland last week, the UK Cabinet, on its third visit to Scotland in a century, uh, jetted into Aberdeen and then jetted out without any engagement with the public whatsoever. The Scottish Cabinet, on our 26th public meeting outside Edinburgh in the last six years, advertised in the press to encourage as many people as possible to come along and ask the whole cabinet questions for the best part of an hour. There's also a, a contrast, I believe, in language. In some of the rhetoric that is used in a debate emitting from the Westminster Parliament, people are labelled. They're termed strivers or skivers, shuckers or workers. That language, thankfully, scarcely features in the debate in Scotland. There is a, a shared recognition that society isn't divided between skivers and, sh and strivers, one group who pay in, another who take out. Everyone contributes to society in different ways at different times, and everyone needs public support in different ways at different times. There's a contrast in policies. Successive Scottish Parliaments, and I'm talking here about the Parliament as a whole, not any single party, have legislated for progressive purposes. We have promoted social justice alongside economic prosperity. Indeed, we see social justice as essential to sustainable economic prosperity. That doesn't mean we're perfect or we never make mistakes. It simply reflects the fact that members of the Scottish Parliament of all parties have worked to reflect the values, tackle the priorities, promote the aspirations of the people who voted for them. That's why there's a very clear majority of people in Scotland who want the Scottish Parliament to have control over welfare and taxation. And I believe over the next six months that will translate into clear support for independence. It's interesting to look at the most recent Scottish Social Attitudes survey. This shows 62% of people, 62%, trust the Scottish Government to work in Scotland's interests. For the UK Government, the figure is 32%. And that helps explain why occasional visits by Westminster politicians to Scotland are being and will be received so badly. The first Scottish Parliament in 1999 introduced world-leading homelessness legislation. The second parliament tackled Scotland's health inequalities through the ban on smoking in public places. 
The third Parliament reintroduced free university education and unanimously passed the most ambitious climate change targets in the world. This Parliament is seeing world-leading action to address Scotland's relationship with alcohol and legislation to expand and indeed transform early years education and childcare. Alongside that, we've adopted policies to support economic growth, cutting business rates, promoting Scotland abroad, giving coordinated and very innovative support to capital expenditure and infrastructure and key sectors of the economy. We now have higher employment, lower unemployment and lower economic inactivity than the UK as a whole. In the last uh, three weeks, people in Scotland uh, have been uh, and have seen an array of approaches from the UK government, what they apparently call their dam buster strategy. Uh, we were love bombed from a distance by David Cameron and then dive bombed at close range by George Osborne. The UK cabinet came up to Aberdeen but chose not to, to meet the members of the public. Uh, I believe that George Osborne's speech on Sterling three weeks ago, the Sermon on the Pound, will come. Uh, to be seen as, as monumental an error as Margaret Thatcher's sermon on the, on the mound some 25 years ago. It encapsulates diktats from on high, which are not the, the strength of the Westminster elite, rather they are a fundamental weakness. And I want to make a contrast, and we shall make a contrast, that we will seek to engage uh, with people across England uh, on the case for progressive reform. George Osborne, in his speech in Scotland, referred to Scotland as foreign, a foreign country no less than seven times. This was the danger, he said, making Scotland a foreign country. Yet the Chancellor surely knows that the Ireland Act of 1949, which was negotiated after infinitely more difficult circumstances than we have, specifically states that Ireland is not to be regarded as a foreign country. And Scotland will not be a foreign country after independence any more than Ireland, Northern Ireland, England or Wales could ever be foreign countries to Scotland. We all share ties of family, friendship, trade, commerce, history, culture, which have never depended on the Parliament here at Westminster and will endure and will flourish long after independence. Now, Osborne's speech was also mistaken in its economics. It totally misrepresented the size of Scotland's financial sector. It offered the most facile and misleading comparison with the Eurozone. It was counterproductive in its politics. A day-tripping Conservative minister saying no to Scotland before flying back to Westminster. And it contradicted, above all, the best interests of the rest of the United Kingdom. His proposed policy of no sterling zone would impose transaction costs on English businesses, it would remove Scotland's substantial oil and gas exports from the sterling balance of payments. And by laying sole claim to the, as a continuing state to the public asset of the Bank of England, nationalised in 1946, it would see the UK government take full responsibility for the liability of the £1.6 trillion of national debt. Now, the, the New Statesman edition this week carries an article from David Sheffer, the professor at Northwestern uh, in Chicago who served as the US ambassador at large during President Clinton's administration. Professor Sheffer points out that, quote, nothing in international law requires Scotland to pay one sterling pound of UK debt if the rest of the UK is deemed a continuator state in this way. Now, I should stress that we've already indicated uh, on page 345 of the White Paper that with agreement we would serve as a proportionate share of the UK national debt. Any reasonable approach to negotiation would, prepare, would propose a share of assets and a share of liabilities. That is simply the right thing to do. And therefore, for the Chancellor to put the rest of the UK potentially in a position of being landed with all of the UK's gargantuan national debt is at best reckless and at worst totally irresponsible. Now, it should be said that once the current campaign bluster is done with, I suspect, I know actually, the UK government will return to the common sense reasons set out in Clause 30 of the Edinburgh Agreement. That is that following the referendum, both sides will accept the result and act in the best interests of the people of Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. But this current dam busters rhetoric has betrayed an attitude as antiquated as it is unacceptable. 
from the myopic perspective of the Westminster elite, Scotland is last among equals. And over the next few months, each and every time we hear another of these lofty interventions telling us all the things we can't do, it will elicit a clear response in Scotland, and that is that the days of governance by Westminster diktat are over. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a, a second future available to people of Scotland, one where we use the powers of independence to transform our country rather than mitigate other people's mistakes. So don't let them tell you we can't build a, a better country. Well, let's take childcare uh, as an example. Two weeks ago, the, the Scottish Parliament's Children and Young People Act was approved. It will see a major increase in childcare provision to 600 hours a week for many two-year-olds and all three- and four-year-olds. It's an important step, but one which uh, falls short of our ambitions for childcare. Those ambitions for transformational change, I would submit, can only be achieved with independence. Now, that's partly because independence allows us to choose different spending priorities. We can decline, for example, to finance the madness of a new Trident programme and invest in the future instead. But most importantly, only independence allows us to benefit from the success of our policies. We've been part of a, a sustained drive to increase women's employment in the last 18 months. The female participation rate is now higher in Scotland than any country in the UK, having increased by over three percentage points in the space of one year, by 74,000 women now participating in the workforce. Using 2012 figures, getting female participation in the workforce up to the same levels they have in Sweden would require an increase of six percentage points or so. The scale of that increase translated into employment would generate around an additional £700 million a year of tax revenues. So what's the problem? Why don't we just go ahead and do it? Well, the problem is, under current arrangements, the overwhelming bulk of these revenues go straight to the UK Treasurer in London. And I tell you, I can see no sign whatsoever in George Osborne's conduct over the last month, over his whole political career, indeed over his whole life, that the first thing he would do with £700 million of new revenues created by a Scandinavian-style transformation of childcare policies is to give these revenues back to Scotland to fund the policy that made it possible. Retaining that revenue in Scotland is what will make that transformation in childcare affordable and sustainable. With devolution, we bear the financial costs of social investment. With independence, we receive the full benefits. <clears throat> Second example is, uh, is population. Back in November, the UK government welcomed a, a report from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which was about actually as damning a criticism of its own policies as it's possible to imagine. And like last week's uh, report from Standard & Poor's, which found Scotland's wealth levels to be comparable to Germany's, the Institute for Fiscal Studies recognised Scotland's current economic strength. Scotland has had a, a lower budget deficit than the rest of the UK over the last five years. The IFS made it clear that our debt to GDP ratio and independence would be lower than the UK's. However, the Institute of Fiscal Studies also predicted that Scotland's population might only grow by 4% in the next 50 years, while the UK's might increase by more than 20 per cent. That's the main reason that the report was welcomed by the UK government. Now, this is part of a, a problem that goes back generations. Uh, Scotland's population has increased by just over 10 per cent in 100 years, from 4.8 million to 5.3 million, while the population of England has increased by almost 60 per cent. In recent years, Successive Scottish governments, not just this SNP one, have worked to address that by attracting people to Scotland to study and then allowing these people to work if they wish to in our country. Until the UK government policy changed, we had some success. The 10 years from 2001 to 2011 saw Scotland's highest population growth in a century. In fact, we saw a higher growth in 10 years than the IFS is predicting over the next 50 years which is perhaps a lesson why you should take population forecasts with an even larger pinch of salt than economic forecasts. However, any reasonable person reading that report would draw the conclusion that Scotland starts from a position of economic strength and that a long-term demographic challenge can be tackled. The UK government's approach is quite different. It seems to be suggesting it will do nothing at all about Scotland's low population growth. In fact, it will pursue immigration policies which make the problem worse. 
In other words, the UK government's vision for Scotland, if we stay tied to Westminster, seems to be one where Scotland, energy rich, resource rich, talent rich, eventually becomes dependent on the rest of the UK at some unspecified point in the future because we haven't been able to address a problem that was a century in the making and which we have decades to sort out. Now, how can that possibly be a positive vision for the future of Scotland? And it raises the obvious question, why would anyone accept that future when instead we could choose to change it? Ladies and gentlemen, choosing to change, to seize opportunities, to, to meet challenges, is at the very heart of this debate that's taking place. What we want to do is to build a better future, to use our natural and human resources to create a fairer and more prosperous country. And the fundamental truth at the heart of the, the case for independence is that the best people to do that, the very best people to make decisions about Scotland's future, are the people who live and work in Scotland. At the start of this speech, I, I referred to the letter sent by the Scottish church leaders 25 years ago. I want to end with a, another voice uh, from Scotland's post-war history. One of the, the finest Scottish political speeches of my lifetime was the Glasgow Rectorial Address given by Jimmy Reid in 1972. He spoke about the alienation felt by many people in society. He described it as the frustration of ordinary people excluding from the forces of decision-making. The feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with justification that they have no real say in shaping or determining their destinies. It's a speech which still resonates today. If anything, its relevance has increased over these decades. Now, independence on its own it will not address alienation, although it will give us the powers to do something about it. But one truly wonderful thing about the debate that's happening in Scotland just now and the vote on the 18th September, it is fundamentally a time not for alienation but for engagement and for hope. Because this referendum isn't about politicians. It's not about me or David Cameron. It's not even about David Bowie. <laughs> it's not about standard life and it's not about standard and poor's. It's not about the press, and it's not about the broadcasters, it's not about the elites in London or the elites in Edinburgh. It's about the people, the people of Scotland. Adley Stevenson once referred to a moment before presidential elections when people became reconciled to the requirements of the modern age. That moment of uh, supreme clarity and often of fundamental reassessment he called the liberal hour. On referendum day, all of the people of Scotland, not just for the first time in 300 years, but for the first time ever, will be truly democratically sovereign. Everyone will have an equal say in the decision. And there'll be a moment for everyone in Scotland on referendum day when they stand in that polling booth and take the future of their country into their own hands. And that moment of uh, opportunity that moment of engaged sovereignty, the moment of clarity and for many of reassessment will come on the 18th September. Let's call it Scotland's hour, because in that moment, and I believe from then on, Scotland's future will be in Scotland's hands. Thank you very much. <laughs>